So Battleground has been out for a whole day now. Are you finished? I hope so before you click this video because it's going to be spoiler talk starting now. And I just wanted to say that before I said, or as Matthew McConaughey once said, Murph! Hey, what's up, bookworms and knights of the Black and Daenerys? I am Mike, and we are here to talk some spoilers for Battleground, the 17th book in the Dresden Files. If you missed the non-spoiler review, I'll put it right here for you. I felt like that was something for people maybe that were excited and hadn't gotten the book in the mail yet or they hadn't started had time to start the audio book yet. Uh, last time I did this, I split it up into a spoiler and non-spoiler. Just going off of feedback, that's what they wanted me to do. So I'm doing it again. Now, I do want to say that this is different than the Peace Talks one. This is not a play-by-play -play summary recap thing. I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, I felt like people were always just wanted those to be cliff notes, and I'm not doing that. What I'm doing is this is similar to my early Wheel of Time videos or what I just did with the Stormlight Archive, which is just I'm going to talk about some of my favorite moments in the book and what I thought about them, just the stuff that really, really stood out to me, some of my favorite character moments, and it's really just opening this up as a forum for discussion below for you guys to talk spoilers with each other because I feel like it's an active enough community that that really is a great idea. And I hope to hear your thoughts here. Now, I want to start by talking about Harry, obviously, because this is his book. I think right away I said, what I love about Dresden Files is you have your main character fighting a fucking Kraken <laughs> in the second chapter of this book. And it was so wild. Such a cool opening scene, really. Like, how do you how do you kick off things, you know, bigger than you ended last book? Oh, have him have a Kraken as he's on his way back to Chicago. And him and, and Laura and, and Molly fight off this Kraken. But the thing that really stood out to me is that he soul gazes with a Kraken, man. And the Kraken is scared of him. So I'm like, wow, okay, so Harry is a scary, scary son of a bitch, right? So really cool stuff that I feel like he's setting up here because it does the same thing with Bradley. Bradley and Rudolph, you know, pull him over and harass him like they always do. And uh, it, it, something happens and he kind of soul gazes with Bradley and Bradley's like, you know, you stay the hell away from me. So even he's spooked by it. So I feel like this is setting something up. I don't think this is happening twice in this book this early for no reason, uh, even if we don't get a huge resolution to it. At least I don't think so. Was there a huge resolution to this? Maybe I was misreading the importance of this moment. That's, that was just something that stood out to me. But yeah, him soul gazing the Kraken was very, very cool. Uh, I love his struggle with the mantle, how it continues to evolve. I mean, he even says numerous times uh, what Mab said to him. The Mab used to be immortal too. So he's just thinking basically he's going to become the monster, right? I, I think that... Uh, who was it? I think it might have been Bradley or Rudolph. I don't recall that was like, you know, you're you're one of the monsters now. I don't think so. I, I may have that confused. I don't I don't remember. Someone basically said that so Harry's kinda of haunted by that. This book, am I becoming a monster? Or will I? Is it inevitable that I'm gonna become a monster? So I, I love stuff uh like that with him being the winter knight, is that he's trying to stay noble. But as you see with the big event later, uh he can snap really, really easily. And there's points where there probably is a point of no return for him. And I'm sure we'll get that before the end of the series. Um uh, the thing with the followers, I thought that was really interesting. Uh the fact that not only that they were following him, uh, but that, you know, he was saying he could feel them. You know, a Mab tells him, you know, that's that's just winter. A really neat idea, and I mean, the thing that he, he could feel each one of them, you know, when they die and stuff, it just made the pain and anguish that Harry's going through in this book even even worse than, you know, what happened a few chapters before. But um, I, I did like him giving, like, that speech, like, like a Darrow from Red Rising, like, giving that speech to pump everybody up. Really powerful stuff. Really good dialogue from Jim this go-around, I thought. Because uh, a lot of times you get some of these speeches where you're trying to pump people up, it just... It either sounds recycled from a movie you've heard 200 times or it just sounds really corny, something never... I felt like it was really delivered pretty well uh, on the page. So uh, I know that that was in that trailer that they made for the book, but th it's better in the book, I think. But uh, again, those trailers are really cool, though. I wish that more authors would do stuff like that. I think the, the Institute for, by Stephen King and this are the last one. I saw like real, like seem like movie trailers for for a book. I wish more would do that. It's a really neat idea. And when that event happens, you know which event I'm talking about, uh, and basically, Harry goes full-on predator mode after after Rudolph. Loved it. Absolutely just adrenaline rushing. You're, you as the reader are already in an emotional state, and it makes where you can just feel Harry's pain and anguish 
while this is going on, he almost murders the shit out of Rudolph. It makes it really, really worth it. And it's just a tough scene. I started thinking, oh my God, now he's fighting Sonya. Is he going to kill either Sonya or Butters? Because I don't know if I'm ready for that. Really just powerful scene, especially after, you know, they get him to calm down. And then he just loses it crying about Murphy. But I mean, oh my God, man, let's talk about it. Let's talk about Murphy. Um, I I liked Murphy. I liked her. I know that the fandom seems mostly most of the fandom seems to to like her. At least I believe so. Like I said, I'm still really new to this fandom. Uh, most people seem to like her. People that are reading it, you know, from the beginning right now, I feel like they're still mixed on her. To me, by book sixteen, I loved the character to death. I loved her and Harry together. I was all for it. I thought quit being stupid and get together. And it's just so gym like to to get the characters together and then take them away. And it is. I know everybody was like, oh, she's going to become a Valkyrie. And she's going to do this or she's going to become a knight. She's just dead, man. She's just dead, you know. And it, it's just, it was tough. It was tough to read. And I, I, I kind of said in the non-spoiler thing is that, you know, Jim has never gotten me to cry with one of these books. But this was the first one where I really kind of felt it and to a point to where my wife saw me read it. She's like, hey, are you okay? I mean, I was like, no, I'm not. Uh, you're invested in these characters after 16 books, man. And uh, having one of them taken away like that. And I know so many people are going to say, oh, well, I've seen the Murphy thing coming for four or five books. It doesn't matter. It's the way that Jim writes it. The whole civil gaze with her and describing it as seeing an empty house absolutely just shattered me, man. It was just beautiful writing for such a tragic, tragic moment. And it's just, how much more of a ringer can you put your main character through? I always make the Buffy comparisons in here. And it, it does. And what Joss Whedon always said was, Buffy, happy, show okay. Buffy, miserable, show brilliant. And I think that he really does, you know, subscribe to that that method of storytelling. And it's it it, it makes sense. It's powerful. And I, I hate, you know, that these two aren't going to end up together. But I just, I knew, I just know that he comes to seem to be from that same vein as a Joss Whedon to where, uh, yeah, you're not going to get the happy ending that you want with everything. So uh, it was devastating to me. It really was. And seeing Harry's reaction to it afterwards was both awesome and heartbreaking. And, and, and like I said, the non spoiler thing where I felt like by the time I felt like I was okay to keep going, then he has the moment where he's basically saying goodbye to her. You know, he takes her gun. And Mab promises that she'll get a you know a, a, a hero's burial, and it just I say, like, God damn it, you got me again, Jim. So uh, yeah, just beautiful writing in this book on his behalf. I feel like he just gets better with his words and his dialogue every book. And what I said in Peace Talks is I felt like what Jim could get between Murphy and Harry without them actually saying anything to each other. In this one, you know, Harry actually says these things. And uh, it's, God, it's devastating. But, you know, at least she went out sort of awesome before the not-so-awesome. Is, is the, the awesome is, you know, she blows up a Jotun with a freaking RPG, a giant. That was a really, really awesome moment. And, but, I mean, to see her go out with an accidental misfire from a scumbag like Rudolph, just awful, you know? And, and I, I think you, you want to see all these characters go out in a blaze of glory uh, but some people feel like that's trope filled. I mean, I always want to see my characters. If they're going to go out, I want to see them go out in a blaze of glory or saving people. I never, that's a trope I'll never get tired of. I like that's part of being a hero, right? But this also makes it more real. I mean, you're thinking about the chaos that's going on in the city right now. It's easy to believe that stuff like this is going to happen. You know, not everyone's going to make it. And it's just, it sucks it has to be this one. And I'm surprised that this isn't the thing that completely turned Harry over the edge and made him go full on winter evil, you know. So uh, it's rough. It's rough, but uh, you know, I, I one thing I did like is that because the shock is still so much there, you know, Harry has obviously accepted this before the end of the battle, and he's still Harry. You know, he you would think that most would just be a basket case or a sack of tears. The rest of the book, he's still making his quips. He's still doing what he needs to do. He's still, you know quoting pop culture and stuff like that. So I like that. And, you know, at the end of this book, it's insinuated that he's got a year uh, of mourning. So I'm thinking maybe while the next book will probably pick up closer to that time period, 
I don't want to say he's over it, but we're not going to have to wallow in his depression like we did after Susan. Uh, again, this is very, very meaningful, and it's going. I'm not saying he's going to be over it. I'm just saying I'm hoping we don't have to have a whole two or three books of him just being absolutely in depression mode. That's all. That's me. That's me. But I, me, I'm in depression mode because I love the character. Uh, so uh, R.I.P. for sure. Um, I think one of his my favorites pop culture references in this. I always said in my previous reviews, I love it when he mentioned Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, and this one has a you shall not pass on the, the Columbus Drive Bridge. Really awesome. Uh, I love that stuff. Keep it coming for sure. Let's talk about Ebenezer here for a second. And maybe I missed something here. It's quite possible. I mean, every one of these reviews, I get told I misunderstood something. So maybe, maybe this is the one. Did I misinterpret how shitty things were between Harry and Ebenezer in the last book where it ended, you know, where he uh, thought that he had killed him and, you know, Harry realized, oh my God, he would have killed me if that wasn't a projection. I feel like there's almost no friction between them. Like I said in the non-spoiler, I understand there are bigger problems at hand, but I feel like they just slip right back into their old roles. He's calling them Haas and he's calling them Grandfather and stuff like that. I thought things would be frigid between these two and it just seems like they just act like it never even happened so maybe i misinterpreted that i thought for sure things were going to be really really rough between them who cares if the apocalypse is coming it doesn't mean you're going to be chummy uh again if i misinterpreted that please let me know because i i was com just baffled by that i thought for sure what i said in the last book is i didn't understand maybe i misunderstood why why ebenezer was being such a hothead and this one i just don't understand why the two of them seem like they're just like back to business as usual it just seemed really really strange to me and let's talk about that big problem and now look when i read this character i say ethnu but i know even jim dropped in the comments of my last video and said it's pronounced ethniu so if i keep slipping back to saying ethnu it's just because like i said when i read it that's how i hear it in my head and i'm sure no matter how i say it people are going to tell me i say it wrong but the Titan, let's just call it the Titan for the rest of this. I know the villains need to get bigger and bigger and bigger in this series. But did he go too far with this? Let's look at the body count here. She beats Mab, Titania, Odin, the Earl King, Ebenezer, River Shoulder. She breaks, listens to Wind's back. I don't even know if the guy's alive. Uh, she flicks away Ivy like she's a flea. Uh, she breaks Sonya's leg. She knocks out Butters. I think Christos got like burned alive. Uh, <laughs> she knocks out Butters, like I said. Uh, she pretty much kills Marcone for all intents and purposes. We'll talk about in a second. I wonder if he tied his hands here. I, I feel like he's... What can you do bigger than this in the future? That's what I'm concerned about. You know, you're going to have this series ending uh, possibly in eight books. I don't know. People people have a different answer for that. That's You're going to end this on this apocalyptic trilogy that we've heard so much about. How do you go bigger than this? I mean, is it going to be like Satan and God fighting? I, I don't even know how much bigger you can go than this here. Because I think about all these all these gods and monsters that Harry's fought or faced in these books. None of them are like this. Where it was just like everyone's scared of Mab and it's like, nope, no big deal. Everyone's scared of Titania. Nah, whatever. Hey, Odin, bink, no big deal. I know what, and I'm gonna take and I'm gonna take your I'm gonna take your spear. Hey, no big deal. Hey, I mean, she's just like a bully in this book and. Again, I like a strong villain. Don't get me wrong. I just don't see... I feel like this ties his hands for the rest of the series. But like I said in the non-spoiler, I'm sure Jim will find a way. It's just, man, was she super overpowered in this. And I mean, it's just, all because of this uh, titanic bronze armor or whatever it was called. Uh, the, the eye, I mean, that was cool. The eye about... That was very, very cool. I like that as a destructive force. But it's just like that no one could do anything to her. And all these super super powerful opponents just no big deal i was i was stunned by that uh basically that avengers endgame moment you know where it's like avengers assemble basically and you have all of the rest of the forces show up there i thought this is where they're finally going to get her and she just fights them off like it's nothing and i was just completely blown away by that not saying it wasn't satisfying with how it went you know her playing the the mind games with Harry, and I was like, yo, he isn't going to kill Michael off and the whole family off off screen like that. Even Jim's not that vicious, right? So, uh, you know, then he remembers that, you know, hey, you know, Mouse wasn't there, and Mouse would never have left Maggie alone. So 
Uh, you didn't get me on that one, but you know, you got me with Murphy. So, uh, anyways, uh, like I said, I don't know if some of these people are alive. I don't feel like we, when we get back and we get like reconnaissance, I feel like he would have mentioned if you know, Listens to Wind was actually dead, or River Shoulders had died, or or Christos burned alive. I, I don't really know. So. Again, I was reading an uncorrected proof, so if there are differences in your text and mine, please let me know. I gotta say Butters and Marcone are pretty much like the co-MVPs of this book for me. Butters just continues to get his confidence. I feel like him and Sonya are making a great team, and this dude is just all about that courage right now. I mean, after... I say all these people that, that face uh, the Titan and get their asses handed to him. Butters is about the only one who really don't. I mean, he does eventually get knocked out there in, 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 in the, when they're fighting her, to fight, he's fighting her with, uh, with Sonya. But, uh, you know, he actually like stands off against her and he has one of the greatest lines. I, I didn't write the actual quote down, but it was something like, she's like, hey, look at all these, you know, gods and immortals I've just beaten and you think that you can stand against me. He's like, hey, big deal. You know who else has done all that? Harry freaking Dresden's done all that. So good, good moments for him in this one. And like I said, his his courage is like through the roof. And I thought for a few moments, I thought Jim was going to take Butters from us. I, I really did. I will say I'm still disappointed we still don't have that third night. But again, with this book, in the middle of a battle, how are you going to just throw that in there? You know? So uh, I, I'm fine with that. I really think going forward, the final arc of the series is probably starting with the next book. And that's where we'll get some of these, uh, these answers that people are longing for. But my dude... Marcone. I actually shrieked out loud when his neck got snapped. I thought that, that he had been killed and I was just absolutely devastated because you know one day that showdown between Harry and Marcone is going to be epic. And now, since he did take up the coin in a, was it small, was it small favor? I think it was small favor where he took up that coin. We assumed that him or guard took up that coin. But the fact that he is now a knight of the Black and Denarius, you know, he has he took up uh, with the Black and Namshul, that was awesome. And I, now that he actually has some magic powers, I feel like when him and Harry show down, it's actually going to be a fair fight now. You know, uh, I, I've always been a huge fan of whenever Harry and Marcone have to work together. I always compare it to Lex Luthor and Superman always eventually having to work together. And then you find out that not only does it work out, but they're actually a really good team together. Uh, it, it's good, but I love the the banter between them. You know, they're very clear on the same side. Harry calling him like a fake wizard and stuff like that. It's just, it's fun. It, it's 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 a good moment, and it, it sucks because you do know that these two are eventually going to have to show down. But I'm glad that uh, you know Jim didn't kill him off before that moment gets to happen because I think that needs to be bigger. And, and the way Harry really screws Marcone at the end of this uh, with the whole eye thing, uh, yeah, they are definitely not okay. They are definitely not on good terms, but uh, a very, very satisfying moment for me uh, when he actually sat up after having his neck snap, and I was like, "What's going on?" So, very, very satisfying. I had, I had almost forgotten. I know that that is a. I looked it up. I looked up some of the things that happened in this book to see if there are theories and these things. And a lot of people assumed that Marcone had taken up that coin. I had always assumed it was either lost or Guard had it, and Guard was going to be the big shocker. Uh, I think we do lose. Hendrix. I forgot about Hendrix. Hendrix does. I do know that he actually got killed in this one. Got killed protecting Marcone. So R.I.P. Hendrix. I said I checked out some Reddit theories after this because I just want to see how many people might have guessed some of these things. And the biggest one that I wanted to look for was Justine being controlled by Nemesis. And I found one. So everyone that's going to say, oh, yeah, I had that bag. I don't know about that. but At least not, you at least weren't talking about it on the internet. Because I, like I said, I found one thread on Reddit that actually had made this assumption. And not only that, is that she's uh, she's actually what he who walks beside. Nemesis is he who walks beside. You know, we've had he who walks behind, he who walks before. Now we got he who walks beside. So really, really crazy moment that I didn't. I didn't expect it all, so uh, I'm continuing what I said when Nemesis first showed up. Is that I thought that Nemesis was going to be the the the, the overarching baddie for the rest of the series, and you know, with Justine being pregnant now, uh, you know, he, Harry does wonder how long has has she been in control or he been in control of Justine? And it said back when her and Laura first came close, and I started thinking about it, is that back in like Death Masks or Blood Rites. So been there for quite a while, so it'll be fun. For the, uh, the the whole uh, 
obsessives to go through these books and look for uh, foreshadowing that might have been there before. I think that that is really awesome if that is actually there. So Molly finally going to tell her parents about her new job and Michael already knowing and acting like it's not a big deal. We're just going to have dinner and then we're going to talk about it kind of thing. So Michael, that is so my dude, man. It's so good. Such a great moment because I kept expecting like this big epic family clash when it happened. But I actually kind of like the way it's written. I actually kind of like the way that he's like, yeah, we already know about it. You know what? And your mother's already made all these preparations to make sure that there's some utensils there that you can eat with and things like that. Hey, it's just one of those things where you just like, yeah, you, you think that you don't know and your parents always somehow knew, right? So uh, I thought it was a, a, a nice way to end this a very serious book with some levity and, and, and some feel-good moments because... Um, it's a book that deals with some shit, right? And uh, I like the way that it ended. Uh, I don't know if this is the way that it's going to be in the final release. In mine, it had the epilogue of Christmas Eve, which was that short story that I think he released a couple years ago. I went ahead and read it because I haven't read it before, but I don't know why he released that before the book come out because you just basically confirmed that who, who, had, who had lived. Uh, I felt like uh, people... Well, I mean, it just you knew that the Carpenters lived. You knew that Molly lived. So I, I obviously... I don't know if necessarily you would have uh, been shocked that that revelation that he's getting, or the mind games that the Titans playing on him actually have the same weight. So I'm glad I didn't read this before. Then you got Mab arranging the whole marriage between Harry and Laura, and it's just so super weird. But I mean, I, I, it makes sense from her part, you know, to join those two uh, courts there. But man, it's... I don't see, basically, there, there is no wiggle room out of things with Mab. You know, I've always said Stone Cold Mab, you know, it's because she said so. You're not getting out of it. So, uh, she's given him a year of mourning. But like I've said, I feel like this book is going to, the next, book 18 is going to pick up when that year of mourning is coming close to an end. So, we'll be seeing a, a resolution to that. Uh, I find it interesting that, that Laura isn't into that either. Uh, I mean, I feel like she's always kind of had a thing for Harry, so I thought she'd be all for it. But, you know... Who knows? We'll see. It was a very interesting way to kind of end that arc there, but we shall see. But I, hey, I'm running kind of long here. Uh, I wanted to keep this under 20 minutes, but, uh, you know, so I'm going to continue the discussion below. But guys, I enjoyed the book quite a bit. Uh, I feel like as a whole, Peace Talks and Battleground together as one story was very, very solid, very satisfying, and, uh, you know, very heartbreaking in some places, but uh, very... Uh, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm very satisfied. Uh, I'd like to know if you guys that waited for a long time, are you satisfied? Because I was actually surprised at a lot of the feedback I got in my Peace Talks video for being positive. That a lot of people were like, this book is terrible. It's one, of my, it's one of the worst. And I was just completely blown away. And I said, maybe that is just because I'm a noob to the series. You know, I haven't been reading it. Well, it's, I think December last year is when I started the series. So uh, yeah, I haven't even been in for a year now. So I didn't have that long wait. So I didn't know if it was expectations or if it was actually just not that good. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not, uh, I don't want to say I'm not close enough to it yet. I already talked about how this book brought me to tears. So obviously I'm close enough to the series, but uh, I didn't have as big a problem with book one, but I do think that this is better, but I am treating it as one book and as one book, I think it's superb and I can't wait to continue the series. Hopefully Jim, uh, within you know a year or so, a year plus maybe, let's give a little bit of a, a breather there, but uh, I'm excited for what comes next and I can't wait to see it. So guys, I will talk to you in the comments. Full series spoilers below. Let's go for it. Let's go wild. I can't wait to talk to you there.